Welcome to Coffee with Kyle number 16. I'm Kyle Ridgeway. Good evening. I wanted to discuss and kind of go over a question, or really kind of two questions, regarding the adoption of newer novel interventions. And so the question that I posed um, in the description here of what I'm going to talk about tonight was, what is more, what's potentially more damaging? Early adoption of ineffective, of techniques that are uh, found to be ineffective, or late adoption of interventions that are found to be, later found to be effective. So basically, early adoption of ineffective techniques or late adoption of effective techniques. That's kind of a question I want to parse out today. So I think our intuitions may not serve us correctly here, and I see a lot of errors in thinking when this concept kind of comes up or when I observe, uh, especially physical therapists, kind of talking about how and why they would integrate novel techniques or new techniques into practice. And some of, some of the errors or some of the things that I feel like I observe or have observed myself doing when thinking about these things is saying things such as, we'll wait for the evidence to prove that it works, or more evidence will come out to support it. Now again, that's coming in with an a priori assumption that this new and novel intervention is effective, as opposed to asking the right scientific question, which is, is it actually effective? So I think that's an error in thinking. Uh, number two is that is talking about, well, it seems to help some people. Again, that may be true, but as I've talked about previously, it might not be true for the reasons that we assume. And again, that's coming, with an, coming in with an a priori assessment or assumption that this is an effective intervention. The third one that I hear a lot is, well, I don't use it on everyone, I use it judiciously. I, I'm really kind of thoughtful and conscientious about its application. And I think the thing that we have to remember with all of these statements is we're kind of making a categorical assessment error. And what I mean by that is that we're actually not assessing the problem correctly of should we utilize this novel intervention or should we wait and be a little bit more uh, conservative in our adoption of a novel intervention or a novel theoretical construct or a novel uh, explanation or story that we may talk about regarding mechanisms. So all those things kind of go together even though they're different, right? So there's actual interventions and the question of whether it works or not and on who. Secondarily, there's the investigation and understanding of why something may or may not work. Um, so Ryan Boggs has just commented, and I think I'm going to have to agree with him. He said, I would say early implementation of a novel technique could be potentially dangerous. Not as significant for PT as medicine, just my two cents. So to go off that, and Ryan, I think that's a great comment, is we have to remember that clinical outcomes do not prove efficacy nor effectiveness. Um, and further, even if they suggest it, they don't prove it outright. And that's why there's a difference between outcome measures, measuring outcomes and treatment effects, and there's a great article about that that I will link to in the comments. But I want to use, I want to use an example here. I want to use an example with ultrasound. Um, you know, many physical therapists, and it appeared especially in the 90s, ultrasound was kind of a new and novel uh, technology and intervention, and it kind of gained in popularity, and a lot more research came out on it, and it seemed to have some um, baseline potential physiologic plausibility actually but then we found out that some of those physiologic assumptions or assumptions of plausibility or assumptions on how it may work or might work or might affect tissues were kind of later found to be somewhat false the claims of its effectiveness were kind of oversold uh, and overblown a little bit and we kind of narrowed and, and kind of constrained our understanding and recommendations of when it may be effective and when it may not be well, interestingly, there was a survey done uh, that was published in 2007. I forget when they actually did the survey. But in any case, not too long ago, and definitely after the time that a lot of research had come out in the late 90s, early 2000s, kind of showing that ultrasound as a, as a treatment for musculoskeletal pain problems, especially pain, swelling, tissue extensibility, all these things that we had assumed it had done, um, you know, that, that evidence had come out to basically fairly strongly say that it's not really that effective of an intervention. We probably shouldn't be using it routinely. So in any case, they did this survey that was published in 2007, and they surveyed about, um, I think they got a response rate of 50, 
50% or so, so they surveyed about 400 orthopedic clinical specialists. So these are physical therapists who are board certified in orthopedic physical therapy. So you would think that, you know, the kind of, this is the upper cut of physical therapists who work in orthopedics, you know. For those who aren't familiar, I think the data suggests that only around five or six percent of physical therapists will go on to reach board certification in any specialty. So we can hopefully or maybe assume rightfully or wrongfully that these people should know the best evidence for the treatment of these conditions. So in any case, they interviewed them and upwards of 80% of the respondents said that they still used ultrasound. And the reasons they cited were all the old theories and postulated mechanisms and kind of um, stories we had made up about why it may work to increase tissue extensibility, decrease inflammation, decrease pain. All of these were listed as, as reasons um, for why to use it as well as why it works. So the reason that I think this is important is which is more dangerous, um, late adoption of effective techniques or early adoption of ineffective techniques. So to the ineffective techniques here, we can't just look at first order thinking because first order thinking would say, what's the risk? We should try to adopt things early because if they end up being effective, we've started that treatment approach or we've started that intervention globally as a profession or even more globally as a healthcare system more early on and thereby we've helped more people. But it seems to me that if we look at more second and third order effects or second and third order consequences and even unintended consequences of early adoption of ineffective techniques, and we look at it from a lot of different stakeholders' points of view, patients as a whole, our profession as a whole, other providers, the healthcare system writ large, patient and provider exposure to potentially ineffective treatments and explanations, I think I'm going to agree with Ryan Boggs' comment that I think it's actually more harmful when we adopt, early adopt techniques that may end up to be ineffective down the line. And the reason why is, is that what that survey data suggests to us is de-implementation is maybe harder than implementation. And there's a reason for that, right? So as soon as we learn something and we start to implement and use it, we have all the cognitive barriers to de-implementation as well as all the logistical barriers to de-implementation as well as all the system level effects and barriers to the implementation. So the cognitive barriers, and I spoke about this a couple of days ago when we talked about uh, changing our mind and cognitive biases and things of that nature. Once we have come to a belief or come to a, what we think is an understanding, anytime we're presented with information that counters that, that will induce cognitive dissonance in our mind. Psychologically, we want to resolve that as quickly as possible because it's a very uncomfortable cognitive and emotional feeling and it's challenging our worldview, which we don't like. So the easy route for us is actually to regress further or deeper into that belief. Therefore, by trying to de-implement ineffective treatments, we may actually facilitate their continued use because of the backfire effect. The backfire effect, again, being when you present someone with data counter to their position or worldview or belief, they actually um, look for more evidence to support their worldview and it actually entrenches them further in it. So that's one reason. But there's also, there's also, um, there's also the logistical barriers to de-implementation, which is we now have to change our clinical behavior even if we have knowledge. And we, so, so we know as human beings that knowledge doesn't ensure action. So if we even break the barrier of getting people to understand it's not effective, now we have to break the behavioral habit really of utilizing it in practice. Now those two things alone in a vacuum are going to make it very hard to de-implement, but then you have the, the situation that not only do you have to unlearn, which is much harder than learning, now you have to relearn how to integrate that technique if you're going to use it at all, but you're also having to relearn your understanding of that research or technique and that becomes very, very difficult because no matter what, even if we try to strip ourselves of mechanistic assumptions on why something works. If we've been using it clinically and potentially even observing temporal pairing of using that intervention in patients improving in certain clinical or, or, or patient report constructs, we are going to make up stories to why it works and those stories may be inaccurate. So now we're going to have to unlearn those stories and relearn new explanations. But it's broader than that. So if we open up our lens to patients and providers, patients may now have heard about this technique or had this technique in the past. And therefore, because of that, they may ask for it or they may request that providers and referral sources ask for it 
or referrals and provider sources may have heard that patients have gotten it and gotten better, and so they may inquire about it. So then you get this positive feedback loop where even if we have the knowledge and desire to de-implement this, we have to fight against the expectations and potential misinformation that patients and other professionals may have as well. So that makes de-implementation really, really hard. Um, so what about the question of the danger of late implementation of effective techniques? Well, I don't think we can unpair these questions because I think one, your answer lends itself to both questions. So yes, it is unfortunate that we do not implement effective techniques as the research is growing or as soon as we should, and this has been well characterized in the healthcare literature that you know, research findings don't permeate into standard practice for somewhere between 10 and 17 years. So that lag is um, quite frankly embarrassingly shameful and we need to do things about that, understand implementation and quality improvement science better to change behavior. But I think by, by knowing that if you're implementing interventions before there is potential evidence or really strong reasoning to do it, especially if they're actually novel interventions. Because most interventions, especially in rehabilitation, are not truly novel, and therefore we can assess them with some plausibility, um, some physiology, um, put them in the context of previous clinical and mechanistic research. So we're not always working in a vacuum as far as knowledge. But that being said, if that's a routine that we're doing, and we say, you know what, no, we think that late adoption of effective techniques is much more dangerous than early adoption of potentially ineffective techniques, you know just by the laws of probability that there will be some interventions that we start to use that end up being proven either ineffective or much less effective than we thought they were or we'll understand them completely differently as time goes on. Because of that and knowing that de-implementation is so hard and going back to that, you know, that survey research from ultrasound, it seems to me that the more th interventions or, or, or theories that we stack on to our clinical care that are tenuous from a scientific or logic standpoint, you're going to have more of those things to try to de-implement and they're going to have all of these secondary problems. So my take is, is that early adoption of potentially ineffective techniques is much more dangerous to the healthcare system and the profession than is later adoption of effective techniques. And again, this all doesn't happen in a vacuum. We already know quite a bit about a lot of the things that we treat and the research suggests we are not good enough at just implementing what we know. Therefore, why would we make a jump to implement things that we don't really know a lot about? I think, even though it's not sexy, is we need to go back to first principles, we need to go back to causal reasoning, we need to go back to what we really actually know about the things that we treat and what is potentially effective for those things, and we've got to get good at the basics. We've got to get good at the fundamentals. And what that means is, is we need to adopt the stuff that we know is actually effective. And as physical therapists, my sense is it's easy for us to jump um, to jump on the, uh, the technique of the month bandwagon because it's cool. It's a cool new thing. It might work. Who knows? This could be the next great thing. And I think if you track any of these things that have come up over time, you can see this curve. You see this rise in popularity, and then the evidence starts to come out. We realize it's not as good as we thought, and then it kind of slowly goes down over time. Newer generations of therapists learn the current evidence, so maybe they don't implement it as much, and these things kind of slowly fade. The people who are highly supportive of them kind of shrink. The use of it clinically kind of narrows quite a bit. Um, and we can take all range of passive interventions and techniques and technology from ultrasound to iontophoresis to phonophoresis um, to traction to electrical stimulation for acute pain uh, to all kinds of other modalities, scraping the skin with instruments, um, even dry needling and manual therapy, you know, we kind of have focused and narrowed our claims about those interventions. And I think we should continue to do that and I think we should continue to focus on getting really good at what we know. Because there's a lot of room for improvement there that could reap some really high impact outcomes. And I think as a profession, one of the issues that drives this is the necessity of continuing education. So there's a paradox or a dichotomy there that we want to stay uh, competent and continue our training, but because of most states mandate that you have to take continuing education, an artificial market is created 
that can be um, influxed with any range of ideas that are really hard to vet. And so if we go back to physical therapist training, the more we can understand the evidence hierarchy and its uh, underlying foundations as well as its different dimensions outside of just the RCT pyramid, the better we can tear down some of these claims and actually vet them in an appropriate way. So I think in conclusion, we need to understand that by implementing potentially novel interventions that either lack evidence or are of questionable efficacy or effectiveness or even questionable potential effect, we may actually be subconsciously confirming and perpetuating the theory, the story, and the assumptions of not just effectiveness, but also of the mechanisms. And I think those things are really difficult uh, to undo. Uh, and I talk about that actually a little bit um, on the last Coffee with Kyle number 15. So that's what I'll leave you with this evening. It was good to see you. Have a great day.